morning and good evening again, everyone, depending on where you are. Thank you for coming. It's early eight o'clock in the morning uh, on Sunday here in Japan. It's evening in uh, the United States and probably late late night in uh, in Europe, depending on where you are. Again, we've got Timothy Langley, um, CEO and uh, representative director of Langley Esquire. So our expert here. Thank you very much, Timothy, for coming for this room uh, and preparing for it. We are all very, very much looking forward to having you, uh, to hearing you, what you have to say. So, as you said, we're going to talk about Mr. Suga and what happens uh, in Japanese politics after the Olympics, and which means also before uh, the elections, the Olympics themselves, geopolitics and vaccines and vac vaccine diplomacy. So, uh, without... Uh, uh, any further ado, we don't have so much time today, so let's start. Thank you, Maya. So, Maya introduced me as kind of the expert, and although I shy away from that, um, I've been um, involved in Japanese politics for about, you know, 40 years, 35 years. I've been doing it for a long time. I love it, and I'm, I'm um, very engaged in it professionally. But I'm not the only expert. There are a lot of people here in the room that have um, uh, deeper insight on uh, other aspects. And it, it's, you know, it's just about building a community and kind of exchanging views on what is going on and why to understand what's, what's happening to us now and uh, what we can predict in the future. So I, I appreciate my, you know, um, launching this room and um, inviting me as a speaker. But it is, it's the room for everybody. So um, with that, um, please come up on stage if you have something to, to offer, something to, um, to weigh in on, um, and just you know, turn off your mic or flash your mic if, uh, if you want to interject something. So with that, <clears throat> let me start with uh, Mr. Suga. Um, although probably in terms of flashing this, everybody wants to talk about the Olympics um, and maybe yeah, that's the hottest issue. That's not the hottest issue for me today. Mr. Suga is the hottest issue for me today. And so um, I'd like to open with that. So um, right now, it is a bonanza for Mr. Suga to be welcoming leaders of all of the um, countries of the world who have chosen to come in to Tokyo uh, to participate in the Olympics. <clears throat> and he is holding court, you might have noticed, and if you haven't noticed, it's important for you to notice and to take take note of, he's holding court at the Gehinkan, which is the state guest house um, in Yosia, very close to my office. Um, uh, it is uh, a palace that was built by the Meiji Emperor for his son, so that he could get accustomed to living in regal splendor as uh, defined by uh, the Westerners. And it didn't quite work out. He built this lavish palace. It, if you don't know of it, it looks like this copy of the Palace of Versailles right in downtown, um, downtown Yotsia, downtown Tokyo, over by the new Otani uh, Hotel. Um, if you haven't been in there, it is open for public viewing. It's, um, it's a unbelievable place. Everything is gold and silver and silk and um, mahogany. It is um, really a palace. But it is open to the, the public for certain events. And the Prime Minister has taken over there. He is receiving uh, visitors there. So that's why you see the chairs in the background. It looks a little bit opulent um, when he's on TV visiting with Macron or um, leaders of, uh, you know, the various uh, states that are, are having um, Olympic athletes participating. <laughs> and so please, um, you know, log that, the Gehinkan or the state guest house. It is a, a, a kind of a central place right now, and it is likely to become even more um, prominent in, um, in political lexicon as we go forward. Um, so the, the one person who did not meet, um, it gets a little bit into geopolitics, but it's important to mention now, the one person he didn't meet was the South Korean President Moon. And this fell apart about this time last week. They were on again, off again. Um, the relations between 
uh, South Korea and uh, Japan are so vitally important. And they're vitally important for the United States as well in creating this bulwark against um, the Chinese incursions into the, uh, the, the South Pacific seas. And so it's, it's important, and it didn't seem like it, it quite worked. It looked like it might work. Uh, a great big brouhaha um, that erupted uh, last week with the DCM in uh, Seoul, the Chinese DCM, the Deputy Chief of Mission, making a disparaging remark. And not many people know about it. If you're in the know, you're probably shaking your head and laughing. Um, but it was pretty um, damaging, and so things kind of came to a close there. We can talk about it if you're that interested. But uh, the point is that uh, the, the president is not here. And it was a ripe opportunity for Japan to move forward and for hopefully Korea to uh, push aside some of their reservations about having a, a tighter relationship with, with Japan moving forward. But the whole point here is that Mr. Suga is um, in the spotlight. He's in the crosshairs. Um, inevitably, he has to confront a election of the lower house. And he also has to confront the end term for his holdover government from the, the, the last part of the Abe administration. And um, this delicacy, this dance, um, kind of dictates what's going on right now, what occupies his time, and what other movements are going on in Japanese politics. And the reason why we focus on Japanese politics on the show is because it's a it's an indicator it's a kind of mirror what's going on elsewhere and why other things happen and how things are determined so with um with the, the prime minister he has announced um a little bit more than a week ago that yeah i think i'll run for prime minister i think i'll i'll run to succeed myself we kind of all suspected that or expected that um and there was move a movement that he might have a, a change of the um cabinet before the election in order to prop up his his standing and certainly before he um, uh, went to become prime minister or, or ran for prime minister because when you dole out these seats as cabinet um, positions these are huge benefits to people and you can kind of sway them to come onto your into your fold by giving them um, cabinet portfolios which are very valuable um, there are more obviously there are more cabinet members i'm sorry there are more uh, politicians than there are cabinet seats and every member of the lower house wants to eventually become prime minister um, whether they say that or not that's their goal and in order to become prime minister you must have at least two ministerial portfolios and you must have in, historically you must have a uh, a party position within the ldp so you can win friends and uh, gain influence in your road to become prime minister. It doesn't work for everybody. Um, there have been a lot of contenders, but it is pretty much the tried and true way to become prime minister. And what Mr. Um, Suga has decided is that he wants to continue being prime minister, just like a lot of people in positions of power. Once you get a taste of it, it's awful hard to... Um, to distance yourself from it. You feel like you deserve it. You feel like you've, you've paid the price for it. Um, and so it's uh, it's something of a psychological battle that I think a lot of these individuals uh, fall into. Um, of the important people that he did meet when he was in the um, Golden um, uh, State Guest House was uh, the French um, President Macron who is important on a lot of different levels. If you saw them meet, um, gosh, it's so funny. Um, people don't even touch each other. They don't even uh, do a fist bump. But with Macron, he actually grabbed his shoulder. They said hello. They stood close to each other. And um, they had lunch together. So if you're watching the news, you see them walking through the garden. That is the garden of the um, state um, guest house. Um, there is a Frenchman who is on a hunger strike about uh, 500 yards from there at the Sendagaya um, station who has received promises from Macron that he will talk with Mr. Suga about um, joint custody 
and um, the parental kidnapping issue in Japan. Apparently that was discussed, um, but I have not heard from Vincent or from people who are uh, supportive of Vincent that uh, that has made any impact or that he's actually received a visit from Macron, which was on the um, on at least Vincent's agenda. He's been on a, uh, he's now on his 17th um, day of no food. It has uh, very little to do with um, Mr. Suga's standing, but it has a lot to do with Japanese politics and how Japanese politics moves forward through um, collective um, irritation or expression of irritation to the Japanese government. And with this, it's it's mostly a foreigner, a foreign dad. Um, most people interpret, but it's it's a wide issue uh, that needs a lot of attention. And I apologize for taking time to talk about it, but it is huge. Um, the other person that um, the uh, prime minister met was the Pfizer CEO, who refused to speak with Kono Toro several months ago um, and insisted only to talk with Mr. Suga about um, the purchase of uh, doses of, of the Pfizer um, uh, vaccine. He's in town. Um, although he's the CEO of a big um, company, it's not a, a representative of a, of a nation, but he gets a high um, a priority because of the doses that um, Japan has purchased and uh, hopes to purchase. So they, they made a, um, um, a contract for 194 million doses by the year, year's end. We're going to get into it when we talk about vaccines and vaccine diplomacy at the end of my um, conversation with you. But um, there is so much going on about how many doses Japan has, where is everything, how come we're running out? You know, I thought we had, you know, one for every person in Japan and then we're giving them away and what is going on here. So there's an awful lot of, of controversy and um, intrigue um, um, surrounding the vaccines, not just uh, Pfizer, but Moderna as well. So um, it's something to keep an eye on. Um, <clears throat> with regard to Mr. Suga's prospects for the future, I told you two weeks ago and I told you a week ago, and I'll tell you again this week, that what is going on right now is just kind of under the blankets, a lot of movement, and it's not going to come out into the open until after the Olympics. We've got another 10 days before the Olympics finishes and then another uh, 10 days for the uh, Paralympics. I think you'll begin to see um, the uh, creases in the seams uh, probably uh, as the uh, Olympics winds down. That means while the Paralympics are going on and the, the, the battle lines are being drawn now, but you have to watch very carefully to, to um, see what's going on. And although I the people who are really seeped in this uh, might criticize me for being so um, um, not very detail oriented about describing what's going on. But the important thing is, it, it is rather complicated. The important thing to remember are the players and the names of the players and their heritage and their pedigree because they never go away. And in this room, we will talk about the same people. Sometimes new people come up. Um, sometimes people that we were talking about, like Koizumi, kind of fall away. We don't talk about them that much anymore. But um, it's important just to keep keep your eye on those people who are mentioned all the time because they will never go away. They're on a roll. They're either leading a faction or um, in, in a, a, a supplementary or maybe a number two position within a faction. And as we all know, Japanese politics, although it's a parliamentary democracy, the, the prime minister is a, um, it's a popularity contest among members of the lower house. And so if you have a political party that dominates those members, and if you have some cohesion where you can dictate to your party members to vote in cohesion, then you will, by definition, be able to select the prime minister. That's how it works here. And so when you focus on the LDP, it's a, it's a, it's a circus tent. I say circus tent, people think it's run by a bunch of clowns. It, not necessarily, that's more like the upper house, but the lower house, it, the LDP is a, a circus of lots of factions. The most important ones are 
the um, Hosoda faction, which is um, the Abe faction. Um, the uh, Aso faction, he is number two deputy prime minister and foreign minister. The Takeshita faction, which is a Heisei Kenkyu Kai, the Kishida faction, and the Nikai faction. So those those five are the, the major ones, and there are a couple of uh, minor ones, people who have true personality or um, uh, money or it's not so much their, their stance on policies, um, but it's mostly personality um, persuasion where they gather other members to their, their fold and they create a, a faction usually inherited. So the reason why, um, you know, Mr. Hosoda, Mr. Aso, Mr. Takeshita, Mr. Kishida, Mr. Nikai are important is because they are the heads of their factions. And typically, it is the head of the faction who will say, don't you guys think that I would be a, a really good prime minister? And so there's horse trading among other faction leaders, and that's how they become uh, the, the prime minister. In, in the current situation, um, Mr. Hosoda is unlikely to become prime minister. He's not even uh, considering himself as a candidate. Mr. Aso already was prime minister. He has expressed no interest in becoming prime minister again, although he would like to and probably um, will stay in a position of power. He's that powerful. He could pretty much call the shots as um, minister of finance uh, for the longest serving term. A lot of people owe him favors. Um, and the third one is the Takeshita faction, whose um, a leader, uh, Wataru Takeshita, just resigned uh, two weeks ago. And this is important because he would not become prime minister. He didn't really um, put himself out there. He was suffering from um, illness. And finally, he just decided that he would um, he would resign. Within his faction are three um, major power players whose names you will hear again and again. So it's important to understand where they come from. Um, Mr. Motegi, who is the current foreign minister, Toshimitsu Motegi, he's the foreign minister right now. Uh, Katsunobu Kato, who is the um, chief cabinet secretary and Yuko Obuchi, who is the daughter of a former prime minister. They all are in this faction. They're all kind of um, contemporaries in terms of power base. Uh, you can't say Motegi uh, trumps Kato. Kato is, is, you know, chief cabinet secretary. He's pretty much up there and a potential candidate for prime minister. Of these three individuals, um, it is possible that uh, one of them will be a candidate for prime minister because he would become the leader of that faction, Heisei Kenkyukai. It's a huge faction. Um, so we've got uh, Motegi, Kato, and Obuchi as potential contenders. Uh, they will have a, a party election or a faction election to determine that. And in the meantime, this race of who's going to become candidates for uh, uh, or against um, Mr. Suga will become more and more open. And as, as you know, and let me repeat it just again, if you're in the cabinet, it is undiplomatic, it's unpolitic of you to challenge your boss. So if you are the foreign minister, like Mr. Motegi, or if you are the uh, chief cabinet secretary, like Mr. Kato, who is not on speaking terms with the prime minister, by the way, um, it would be um, bad taste for you to run as a candidate against him if you're in the cabinet. So you would have to resign. And that's why the idea of uh, having a cabinet reshuffle had so much um, uh, energy to it. Um, two weeks ago, it has died down now, and um, a different scenario has come up. So I just wanted to go through that with uh, the Takeshi <coughs> faction, or the Heisei Kenkyukai faction, and movement that is going on there. Um, the, the final thing I want to talk about, and it always comes up, uh, there, there are a couple of things that always come up. Uh, what's going on with uh, Koizumi? You know, is Koizumi going to become prime minister? What's going on with Konotaro? Is Konotaro going to become prime minister? And what's going on with Koike? 
And just in the interest of time, I'd, I'd like to forget about um, Koizumi, like many people have already. Um, uh, Konotaro, he's got his his issues because of the the vaccine. I still like him as a as a contender. He's not number two in the Aso faction. Um, he's he, he doesn't have as much uh, seniority. He's got lots of uh, portfolio um, ministerial portfolio. He's got three of them. Uh, he hasn't served within the LDP uh, party, and therefore is. Um, a lot of people say unliked. I don't know if that's the correct characterization, but he's unknown among the party leaders as a facilitator, as an election winner, or that sort of thing. So he hasn't developed that that kind of uh, um, patina that is required. Um, but Koike, I'd like to talk about a little bit because she just finished the election for uh, the elections for the members of the um, Metropolitan Government of Tokyo, and. She did pretty well, um, better than they expected. They thought that the LDP would swoop in and um, maybe take over a majority of the seats. They did not. Uh, she did well, and she played the game very well. By um, As soon as the election was called, she um, went in the hospital for exhaustion. She went in. Uh, she didn't show up for work and then just showed up on the last day of election, campaigned. Uh, Effectively, but somewhat mildly, and then her party did. Uh, her, her, you know, the people that supported her or that she supported did uh, did well. So she's sitting well. Two days after that, she visited Mr. Nikai. Mr. Nikai is, um, you know, the the fifth largest faction in Japanese politics. He is the secretary general of the LDP, which means that if you want to be a politician and run an election district. He decides. So this distribution of, of power and, and uh, responsibilities, the LDP secretary general gets to determine which election districts you get to run in if you're going to run under the LDP. And um, uh, he also happens to be the, the staunchest um, ally of China within uh, the, the power base of LDP politicians. Um, he, he's very close with Koike have been for a long time, <clears throat> and um, it appears that uh, there is going to be some movement afoot that um, she might run for the lower house. And as we get closer to the end of the Olympics, that prospect will uh, become more and more apparent. So keep your eye on that. It's a little bit early to um, to call it, but she did run for the LDP in 2008. Um, and then she changed parties a couple times. She's she's known by critics as the wandering bird of Nagatacho. Um, but, you know, it is Japanese politics and you have to be deft and you have to um, move quickly and, you know, damn the torpedoes, damn the, the critics. Uh, she's been pretty successful with that. So let's see um, how that comes about. And then uh, finally, um, you might remember that I mentioned uh, Yoshimatsu Hayashi uh, last week. <clears throat> He's a member of the upper house. The prime minister never comes from the upper house. And he has um, said that he's going to change houses from the upper house into the lower house, thereby telegraphing his desire to become prime minister. The interesting thing about Mr. Hayashi is that um, he's in the uh, Kishida faction, which is a pretty powerful, number four powerful faction in the LDP. And um, you might also recall that two, two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, his name started to come up more and more influentially in politics about a, being a, a viable contender uh, to Mr. Suga. And Mr. Uh, Hayashi is in uh, this political faction. Um, and he's probably a little bit more popular than uh, Mr. Kishida. Um, and there's a, a potential conflict or competition between the two of them in the attempt to become prime minister. It's unlikely that Mr. Hayashi, who wins a seat in the lower house, also asserts a candidacy for the prime minister. There's just not that much time to go through that. Mr. Kishida certainly will um, 
aspire to a premiership. And if you, you read the press that comes out of, of um, the typical rags, um, the same refrain comes out. Mr. Suga would probably be the prime minister because there's nobody really potentially a potential contender, you know, and that's such hogwash. They even said that um, during the Abe administration that, when, you know, when Mr. Abe goes, there's nobody there because nobody can compete with uh, the likes of Mr. Abe. And I think it's just this this meme that goes on. Don't pay any attention to it. Um, anyway, um, I'd like to close up uh, this with Mr. Suga. His um, approval rating continues to plummet. Um, he's, his major claim to fame is the establishment of the um, digital agency, but his success with vaccines and with um, the Olympics is uh, an open question. I don't know if he has enough uh, wind in his sails to carry him through in the uh, ultimate election of, of the Prime Minister. With that, I'd like to close it up, see if there's any, well, nobody's come up to the room to, to say anything, so unless you leap up and Maya recognizes you, then I'll just move on to uh, my topic of the Olympic. I have a question to you uh, while waiting for you know anybody else to decide whether they would like to comment or not. So you mentioned, I'm sorry, okay, but please bear with me. Okay, so you mentioned that, yes, um, in uh, the Keshta section, there are three potential candidates, right? Motegi and Kato and Obuchi, right. Miss Obuchi. And then you, you also said that Motegi, he's not going to, obviously, for, well, obvious reason, any reasons, uh, he's not going to be a, a strong candidate or anyway, he's just probably not not uh, not a candidate at all. And then uh, the other one is Kato and we've got Obuchi. So uh, does it mean that Obuchi, uh, of course, there, there will be election, an election uh, within the faction, but does it mean that Obuchi uh, has uh, that um, potential to become, oh, well, let's say to, to become a candidate for prime minister this fall? Because it, um, it's interesting. I'm I'm asking because uh, there is obviously obviously you know a strong um, uh, trend nowadays uh, of uh, getting women in uh, you know uh, let's say leadership positions. So and we're talking of course about Miss Koike, but Miss Obuchi, he, she is probably another you know um, candidate for that. Because let's let's be honest, there aren't so many women in politics, so it's probably a good timing for thinking about that, getting more women involved and in leadership positions there as well. Sure, sure, it's it's a great great timing, but it's not such great timing for her mm -hmm. because uh, so many people, when you talk about um, Yuko Obuchi, they just remember the scandal that kind of got her to resign from her ministerial um, responsibilities um, about seven years ago. Um, but she is the daughter of a former prime minister. <clears throat> and one could say that this um, faction kind of belongs to her uh, heretically. Um, I don't think that that carries a lot of weight. And besides, compared to Motegi and particularly Kato, she's just a shadow. So maybe um, she could um, uh, horse trade with these two individuals about being the leader of the, the faction, but not running for president and supporting one of them to become the, the president. And I think that sounds pretty good. I think uh, Motegi, Motegi um, I think he's, he's probably, um, yeah, he's better suited for an LDP party position, and Kato is, uh, he's qualified now as a prime ministerial candidate. So I think probably you'll see Kato as a, as a candidate against his best friend, Mr. Suga, who they don't talk to <laughs> each other. So it's, it's an interesting mix. Obuchi does have, um, yes, she's got uh, a dream. She has a vision. Um, and yeah. Let's let's see how it runs out, and maybe Hayato has some some dirt that he can share with us. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. So you know this um, uh, Obuchi, like it's very interesting that she finally came up again. You know because uh, Mr. Aso always said 
that he's Isn't that interesting? Time. You're absolutely right. It's just right, yes. Yeah. Uh, Asa always said last 10 years that, uh, I'm sure he'll say that again now, that he's going to make her the first uh, female Japanese prime minister in the history of Japan. That's always what he says. And uh, uh, Mr. Asa has not really like, you know, support that corner power, as you know, because he's not even running around to push it. That's right. He's going to, he's going to do that for this uh, opposition. Right, yeah, because, uh, uh, but, you know, like you just said, there, there's a faction, you know, belong to her, you know, she's a successor, right, yeah, so for that, you know, and also like Mr. Arthur seems to have a very kind of strong personal commitment to make, uh, push her all the way up to the top, right, so now he's getting uh, closer to the okay, end of his career, that he's getting old, Mr. Arthur, right, so I'm, I'm going to be surprised. That, you know, this is the time that maybe he'll make the last push. And also, what's more interesting was this, uh, you know, that Miss Obuchi suddenly came out as a member, you know, representative for the hydrogen, so, you know, industry. You know, so she is uh, head of the, this uh, Green Remy, you know, which is a, you know, a group of, uh, you know, congressmen, Senate, Japanese, right, and who are heading, uh, you know, representing industry. So it's just, uh, she just came out of uh, nowhere to Suddenly start dictating, you know, the policy, you know, for the, the hydrogen on behalf of the uh, Japan, Japan's Hydrogen Association, which is, uh, you know, headed by Toyota, Sumitomo Bank, and uh, Iwatani. So it, it is, uh, and, uh, that's, that's probably the fastest growing, most in the, uh, important industry today, globally, right, with the hydrogen power generation. Yeah, so for that, and she is going to become the leader there. Uh, she has a power base and capital base to back it, too. Push all the way to the top in ten years, but not, not this time. <laughs> and that's okay. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a great um, a great point, Hayato. You will notice that um, uh, individuals who are aspiring for um, the prime ministership or um, to become a, a kingmaker set up um, in plenty of time beforehand. So it's one of those things in the T that you can see that leads to something else, and that is setting up a Gin um a coalition of uh, DIEP members. And um, to become a member, it's not divided along factional lines uh, when you set up a Gin Lenmei. So a lot of factions come out of building a coalition of um, like-minded members of parliament and then gravitating into some sort of a cohesion, um, maybe even a faction. So that's how it normally starts. But if you want to become prime minister, number one on your, your list is you have to have the votes, but you have to have money. And you will notice that um, over the last uh, three months, several brand new coalitions have been started by Nikai, by Mr. Abe, by Mr. Um, uh, uh, Amadi for separate issues that are real potential pork barrels, hydrogen being one of them. So her setting up a, a, a coalition of like-minded diet members is a huge signal. It might be just to generate, you know, um, funds and um, have, having access and your fingers in the um, decision-making process of large industrial projects, thereby um, increasing your COFR for a uh, potential um, bid or for helping people win elections. Um, but we'll see that. And just while we're on that, uh, getting the money to influence people is what got Abe into trouble with Hiroshima and the um, um, distribution of money to uh, politicians in uh, uh, the Hiroshima prefecture that you remember two members of the parliament were arrested on. Um, so that's kind of the, the virtuous circle that, that goes on there. And I, I just toss that in so that you you keep everything in mind. It is all interconnected. It is all related. Thank you very much, Hayato. Thank you. Well, it seems that uh, at the moment there aren't any other uh, questions or comments. So let's continue with the next topic. So the Olympics. Uh, I, I, think, I think the reason why there aren't any comments or questions because there's so few women because you know when when the women are here they just occupy they take all the oxygen we right? talk a lot i know so uh, uh, yes yes yeah. a lot yes well, that is a segue we're going to talk about the olympics 
going to talk about the Olympics now because Mr. Mori made that famous comment, got into so much trouble, lost his position as chairman. <laughs> but yeah. I don't know if you followed this, Maya, that the current chairman of the Olympic Committee has suggested that Mr. Mori would make the most excellent supreme advisor to the Olympic Committee. Did you follow that? Yes, there was uh, some news about that, and it was really yeah. surprising. Well, so so this old guy, I mean, he is a tough nut. Um, I think he's about 160 years old, um, <laughs> and he just he wants to be in the, the limelight. He he demands it. He was the you know the leader of the Osota faction uh, beforehand. He was prime minister, and um, he put himself in as the Olympics because he knew that that would be the, the next big big thing. He was forced out because of his, his uh, comments about women, um, and now he just, he always wants to be there. You might have seen him in the um, uh, state guest house again, as they were, they had a big ceremony at, at the beginning of the, the Olympics, the night before the Olympics, they had a big ceremony there, and he was very prominent there. And so, <clears throat> A lot, as I, as I talked earlier, a lot is kind of emanating from the, uh, the state guest house. So please put that on your map. Anyway, about the Olympics, um, you know, the numbers, it, it's just like a perfect storm. You know, the last thing we need is a typhoon to hit or an earthquake. And sure as shooting, you know, a typhoon will hit Tokyo uh, this time next week. Um, it is uh, now forming uh, outside of um, Okinawa, and it is scheduled to hit um, probably uh, Saturday or Sunday next week, which is just, you know, give me a, a break. Um, the, the numbers um, are just rocketing up. Uh, Mr. Suga promised that he would have a, um, a safe and successful Olympics meaning that the athletes would be um, protected and vaccinated and that the, the supporters, um, you know, the volunteers would be uh, safe and protected and that the spectators, should there be spectators, would be, you know, in a, a number that would allow for social distancing. Everything collapsed in about a two-week period of time. But to the rescue, of course, came... Um, um, uh, what's his name? Bach. Uh, yes. His first name, I can't remember. Um, the uh, head of the Olympic Committee who came in and said to Mr. Suga, I'm sure Mr. Suga was happy to hear it, that there will not be any more infections, that we have these bubbles that are secured in the Olympic Village and throughout all of Tokyo. And by the way, Mr. Suga, I can't believe he said this. By the way, uh, should the numbers come up, let's, let's let the spectators in, okay? Huh? Okay? So um, <laughs> You must be joking. No? No, he did say that. Oh. Yes. So it's, um, uh, gosh, the derision that is is um, uh, directed at that one individual is so um, is so strong, uh, and it's nationwide. You know, the, the vast majority of the Japanese people didn't want the Olympics, didn't want spectators, and uh, the numbers keep keep showing that. And you might. Also, I'm, I'm sure you saw it, it's, it's just unmistakable, the uh, protesters outside of uh, the uh, stadium for uh, stopping the Olympics, it was the biggest deal um, there, the loudest amount of, of uh, controversy. And at the state guest house also, they approached as close as they could. There's a park in front of the, uh, the state guest house that is a public gathering. And they had a huge protest there of people against the uh, Olympics, very well organized and very loud. That was on Thursday night, and then the Olympics started on Friday. Um, but, um, you know, except for what um, Mr. Bach said, you know, there, there are 20, 30 infections just within the village. And a hundred of those are people that are related to the Olympics, like volunteers, bus drivers, that sort of thing. And about 20 to 25 are infections within the village. That means um, uh, people who are um, athletes, uh, they're Olympic officials. There are 10 of them who are Olympic officials. 
um, three that were outsourced and three that were in the media. And the problem is, is that you can only, <clears throat> I mean, the Japanese are really good at counting and, and at numbers, but you, you've got to um, imagine that the desire to keep the panic down and to keep calm overweighs um, the uh, desire for free information and to tell everybody what's going on. So I think you'll only find out later about that. But, um, you know, the, the first victim of that was the South African soccer team, which were, they had some, they had three of their athletes uh, tested positive. So they, when they came in, they couldn't really go out to the field. They couldn't acclimate to the weather. Um, and they did get um, beat in their first, um, their first trial. And they also had a piece, their coach came on um, TV to talk about the ostracization that they received quietly, the, you know, people not, not extending the hands to shake their hand, but actually physically running away when the, when the team approached, when the team walked down the corridors or walked onto the field. Um, and this was um, unexpected. And, you know, if you've been in Japan for any period of time, you can appreciate that that happens quite a bit. You don't have to have COVID or be from South Africa to experience that here. But um, for a, a visiting um, Olympic athlete to to to, to see that um, is just um, it really was shocking for him. On the opening day of the Olympics, there was no spectators except um, about a thousand people attended the opening ceremony. About 150 of those were Japanese, and then. The rest of them were uh, foreign dignitaries. You know, um, uh, Dr. Jill Bush, uh, Jill um, Biden, was in town and she attended. You saw on the um, the grand dais where the emperor was, and uh, Mr. Suva and Mr. Um, ba were on this, um, you know, welcoming ceremony and making the speech and stuff like that. That the empress was not there. And in fact, the emperor himself was uh, reluctant to show up because he is um, a protector of the Japanese people and the voice of the people is, you know, we don't want to have the Olympics and COVID is making us suffer. So his heart really is there, but he did show up, but the empress um, uh, refrained. And that's, it's not talked about, but that the symbolism, the symbolism there is, is very strong and it is, it bears mention. And um, finally, the, um, the controversy, you will find more controversy coming out of this from the foreign press than you will the Japanese press. So um, the Japanese press is pretty, I don't know, it's, it's, it's tightly controlled and monitored. Um, and you can see that in a lot of different um, ways and a lot of different press pieces that come out. And it is really the Bunshun and the uh, Shincho uh, magazines that publish a lot of the stuff that's going on as an undercurrent and as a, as a counter story to what is being fed the public. So um, this um, uh, opening ceremony where the, um, the music was produced by a, um, He's not a young man. He's known as Cornelius uh, overseas, but uh, Oyamada Keigo, who produced the opening theme and had the dancers all choreographed to that. And he had a piece on the, the ending scene as well. Um, a week beforehand, um, he was uh, identified. I guess he had been identified earlier as uh, somebody who had um, attacked, uh, disabled, and um, just some of the things that he had put in um, uh, social media and statements that he had had and just his persona only then became um, an item of interest and brought to the attention of the Olympic Committee who um, pushed it aside and said, well, it's just one of those things and he's apologized, but it became a real big issue. And um, I'd like to talk about that a little bit if... Um, if there's interest in pursuing that, but this idea of hate speech uh, really flared, um, you know, with the Olympics clashing with the Olympic theme of peace and unity, um, it became a really big issue. The other issue is the, um, I'm sure everybody remembers you, the Ugandan who um, 
escaped from the team and took a Shinkansen to, uh, to Nagoya because he said in a letter left in his um, hotel room, you know, I've always wanted to work in Japan and it's been my dream and my work living in, in my country is so hard. So he split. Um, the, they didn't capture him. They found him. He did have help here. Uh, Nagoya is the second largest population of Ugandans in Japan. Um, and when the first story first came out, it was almost like a slap in the face of this bubble of protection within the Olympic Village and among the athletes because one guy just escaped. And who knows? Is he carrying? Is he, well, you know, what? And he's from Uganda. So, gosh, you know, he's a weightlifter. Um, it turns out that um, uh, he was, he came to Japan with his coach and with the team. But as soon as he got here, he found out that he was eliminated from competition for some technical reason, uh, just because uh, the competition just continues and they want the best, ass, the best athletes uh, to compete. And it turns out that once he got here, he was eliminated from the competition just for, for whatever reason, not because he did something wrong, but just because of the technicals. And as a consequence of that, I guess he just uh, decided, well, uh, you know, when I first heard the story, I thought it was his his diabolical plan. Ever since he began to lift weights, that he was going to use this as a ruse to go to Japan, but apparently not. Um, but they got him, and he is now uh, back home with his wife and child, and probably never to return to Japan again, unfortunately, for him. And the only other kind of interesting thing that I'd like to mention about the Olympics, and there are thousands of things we could talk about, and maybe when we open the room we can um, uh, explore them a little bit, is the withdrawal of Toyota uh, a week before the opening of the Olympics. This is a huge hit to the um, Olympic organizers and also to the, the luster and the reputational value of the Olympics. Uh, there are a lot of reasons underpinning Toyota's decision. They're also suffering from um, issues in uh, Southeast Asia with production, with um, uh, supply chain, and in the United States, they're, they're suffering from some issues as well. And I think maybe they decided to fall out of the limelight, although everything was in place, um, but it's the general population that buys their product. And so I think they, like the emperor, wants to respond to um, the, the general population and, and are very sensitive to that. It was a big deal, and I think it was uh, something that um, came as a sudden and kind of a, a very curious thing to happen uh, so close to the beginning of the game. With that, I'd like to close. There are other things to talk about. Um, so let me just open the room from there. Maya? Yes, thank you for that. Uh, Stephen, welcome up on stage. Hi, good morning, and uh, thanks again, Timothy and Maya. Good morning. Oh, Thank you. such a great room. Um, I thought the Olympic ceremony was really interesting for many reasons. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm an international relations person, so I, I look at it from that standpoint. But I thought it was really fascinating to see the uh, self-defense forces carry the flag up to the uh, Olympic podium. And uh, the reason why I thought that was interesting is that it's, that it, it's normalizing uh, a group of individuals that has really contributed to Japan in many different ways, whether it's Operation Tomodachi after 311, or um, helping with the floods in Kyushu last year, um, or of course the regional defense within the region. And I thought that was something significant that um, I think people that are in this room would, might be thinking about. That the Japanese government and the organizers, I think, want to normalize the self-defense forces. So they're seen not in the uh, in the light of Imperial Japan, but um, as a productive force of, of good for uh, domestic Japan and regional Japan. So I thought that was something that was really interesting to take home. Um, also, from the Olympic um, ceremony standpoint, this was um, painted, I think, in the press as low key, but I think that was quite intentional. Um, it was intentional to, to inculcate diversity into the ceremony, and we saw that with uh, Osaka Naomi uh, lighting the, the flame, um, but also with the dancers in terms of their style, their, um, what they were doing. They, you know, we had kind of rappers, people that look like rappers, and 
uh, gothic people, and then of course the uh, kabuki theater uh, person, really presenting Japan as both modern and um, traditional. Um, and, and, old. Old. and old, and, Stephen. Yeah, and old, absolutely. absolutely. Did you see all of the people that were waving? I mean, their arms must have been exhausted, but they I were. Uh, that was that was really huge. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, but I think that this was, you know, it was quite intentional to present a contrast to the 2008 Beijing Olympics, where it was all about power and prestige and history. Um, and I think that the organizers really had a strong sense that Japan is part of the international community. It's part of international values. Um, it's trying to, uh, you know, chart a path towards a more diverse future. Um, and of course, we all know it's imperfect, uh, but there's no perfect country out there. But I thought these were some really important signals. Um, and I was, you know, I was really impressed by the gratitude that they showed to the healthcare workers. They had moments of silence for the healthcare workers and the people of Japan for uh, have lost uh, and, and the world that have lost um, people in the COVID pandemic. And uh, you know, there were so many details. Uh, whether it was the five children that uh, from the Tohoku area, victims of 311 that came and bared the torch and passed that on to Nami Osaka, uh, the elderly, as you mentioned, Timothy. So it was uh, an Olympic ceremony that had many levels and many details that I think are really interesting for us to talk about. Thank you. One point I'd like to um, mention to everybody is, you know, the things that we talk about in this room are but the reason why we talk about them because they're precursors, they're potential precursors to what else is, is happening. And the fact of the um, self-defense forces, um, you know, the, the, maybe it's an attempt to normalize them or to make them more public. In Japanese uh, society, you hardly ever see the self-defense forces unless there's an emergency or a disaster or something like that. And my office is um, very close to Ichigaya where the Ministry of Defense is. And you never ever see that there are throngs of people that stream into there uh, who are military officers and um, uh, members of the S FDF, SDF. You, you don't see anybody in uniforms. But once they get in there, they change into their uniforms. You never see, you, would, you might see this in Israel or in, in the United States or, or elsewhere where people feel a pride of, of membership and, and uh, dedication and patriotism. You don't see that in Japan. They take off their uniforms. You never see them in public riding the trains or anything like that. And maybe if, if we see a little bit more of this, this little opening, this, this feeling of pride or representation of, of what it means to be Japanese becoming a little bit more apparent, um, that's, a, that's a huge signal. It, it really carries a lot of implications. I don't want to go on and on about it, but it's a, a, a pretty important um, observation. Yeah, Timothy, I think that something, again, we should be thinking about um, when we're looking at um, Japanese politics is the division between so-called conservatives and I guess um, the other end is the pacifists or the, the liberals. And um, I think how different groups have painted uh, the self-defense forces in different ways. And this is a debate in the public, it's a debate about Article 9. It's a bit debate about Japan's national identity moving forward and uh, thinking about the uh, self-defense forces being part of the Olympic ceremonies and normalizing it um, really, I think, shows that at least the Japanese um, leaders are thinking about how uh, the Japanese self-defense forces can be more accepted in Japanese society um, so that they can be a more pro proactive member of Jap the Japanese community, but also, I think, deal with some of the security challenges that are in this region and be more active international players as well. Absolutely. So we've got some more things to talk about geopolitically and also some of the players, um, Yasuhide Nakayama, for example, who is Vice Minister of, of Defense, was in the news prominently last week. But um, before I get uh, too far into that, Ted, welcome to the floor. Well, thank you. Uh, greetings from California. It's always good to have you here, Ted. Thank you so much. I, I just love your guys' show. I mean, I learned so much. Uh, apologies if you hear a bunch of racket in the background. Uh, the unit below me is being remodeled by a large crew with vigor, and it sounds like World War III has broken out here. Um, anyways, uh, for the <clears throat> Olympics opening ceremony, it was learned that the creative director of the opening ceremony Kentaro Kobayashi 
who had previously been a member of a popular comedy duo called Robbins, uh, had performed a skit back in 1998 in which he joked about the Holocaust. Uh, this video surfaced, and when you watch the video, you can see Mr. Kobayashi flippantly referring to the Holocaust as a let's massacre Jewish people game of sorts. And uh, when the Olympic Organizing Committee <clears throat> learned about this, <clears throat> excuse me, Mr. Kobayashi was terminated. And Olympic Organizing Committee President Seiko Hashimoto, <clears throat> excuse me, she did the right thing by firing Mr. Kobayashi. And although this skit was performed many years ago, uh, I think we can agree, ridiculing an historic tragedy, the Nazi Holocaust, and affiliating this, this uh, opening ceremony with Mr. Kobayashi, that would have gone against the spirit of the Olympics, and it would have of course, insulted the, the six million Jews who were killed during the Nazi Holocaust. And, uh, you know, it, one of the other reasons it was the right decision by Ms. Hashimoto was that uh, it really goes against the spirit of the Paralympics also. You know, in the Paralympics, we celebrate the achievements of those who are physically challenged. And one of the Nazis' many crimes was to gas and murder anyone in German society who had disabilities with their campaign that they wanted to perpetuate this myth of the perfect and strong Aryan race. So again, the decision to fire Mr. Kobayashi was the right decision by Seiko Hashimoto and it was done promptly, which was appropriate. Now I know that the Olympics have become controversial in Japan and that the arrangements have angered many. Yet I think the Japanese people should be proud with what transpired during Friday night's opening event. Since Japan made a bit of history, uh, and I think Japan needs to be commended, uh, Japan's Olympic Organizing Committee allowed, for the first time ever, for the victims of the terror attack of the 1972 Munich Olympics to be remembered during the opening ceremony, the first time in, in uh, half a century. Um, you may recall that a moment's silence commemorated the 11 Israeli athletes who were killed by the Palestinian gunmen. And um, to this after a very long campaign by the families of those victims, in which they've been urging Olympic Committee after Olympic Committee to honor them, but um, many of those requests have been repeatedly rejected. You know, I don't know who exactly was responsible for this decision, but God bless them. Uh, I know that Japan has elevated relations with, with Israel in recent years. Much of that was due to uh, former Prime Minister Abe's efforts. Um, uh, I have also been fortunate to come to know a few other uh, officials in Japan who played a role in this. Kudos to them. Um, I just also want to think that maybe uh, it is possible that IOC President Thomas Bach may have played a role. I know he's been a bit of a boob lately. Uh, with <laughs> announcing in Tokyo how much he wanted to thank the great Chinese people. Oh, my God, what a blunder that was. Uh, but to give Bach his due... When, when uh, he was referring to the Japanese people, right? <laughs> yes, and he said it in Tokyo, of all places. I'm like, oh, good heavens. Uh, but, you know, Thomas Bach, he was an Olympian himself. He was a contemporary of those Israeli athletes who were murdered at the 1972 Munich Games. And, of course, those games took place on his country's soil. He's a German citizen. And some have thought that maybe Mr. Bach wanted to contribute to the arrangements given what happened not only in Munich, but, of course, Germany's culpability in World War II. I don't know if Thomas Bach played a role, but whoever was behind that decision, I think um, we, we ought to give kudos to them, and Japan should be proud that that happened last, uh, on Friday evening. That was a really good thing. That's all I have. Thank you. Um, Stephen, I thought you might have something to, to add there, but the Weisenthal Foundation was, was prominent in, um, in this issue as well, and Yasuhide Nakayama, who we both know and respect greatly, and who is a great friend of Israel, has always been a great friend of Israel, 
um, it seems that he, he was embroiled in a, a bit of a controversy because he took this matter, apparently uh, the issue was brought to him um, somewhat recently. Uh, he pursued it um, with um, a bit of vigor, um, but didn't direct it to um, the, his ministry, is the, the defense ministry, but also he plays a role in vaccine diplomacy as well. Uh, but he, he was criticized because he didn't bring it to the prime minister's office initially. Do you have anything to, to shed on that? Or, Stephen, do you have any insight on, on how that uh, that rolled out? Well, I know that Vice Minister Nakayama um, informed the Simon Wiesenthal Center of the news. Um, what were the internal machinations of his uh, workings within uh, Japan? I don't know. Maybe Stephen knows. Well, I think the, when we can take a look at it, if we look at the readouts from uh, Japanese ambassadors in many countries, whether it's the Australian uh, in Australia or Canada, the United States, um, the ambassadors all make very strong statements about, uh, first of all, the inappropriateness of the uh, of these comments about joking about the Holocaust um, and the appropriateness of, of firing uh, uh, um, the individual immediately, and that. Um, Japan in no way supports any of these comments. Uh, and I thought that was quite interesting to, to see that the uh, uh, Japan's uh, foreign, uh, foreign policy team uh, really direct uh, a strong message to the international community, to the Jewish community, that in no way Japan condones any um, anti-Semitism uh, uh, as, as a government. And I thought that was an appropriate response to get out there ahead of the, uh, the discussion and uh, send the strongest signals that uh, Japan is uh, a strong supporter of Israel, a strong supporter of Jewish people, and a strong supporter of, of, of uh, a transparent history which really acknowledges the, the tragedy and the horrors of, of the Holocaust. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we you know it's interesting because uh, even uh, well, despite all the controversy, the Olympics have really shown that uh, issues which in the past were used to be thought, you know, that well, they were ignored by the public, by the government, and so on. They have surfaced and they have been, you know, paid attention. They have been dealt with properly, in the best possible way this time. So, which means that change is really coming to Japan and people really, and I, I used to be one of them, you know, that things that don't happen here and so on, but the country is changing and the public opinion is changing as well. And it's changing really in a very good way. Stephen, good morning. Thank you very much for coming up. Yes, hi, good morning. Good morning. Hey, good morning, Tim. I, I have a question with regards to um, companies like Toyota who's pulling out uh, the sponsorship of the, the, uh, the Olympics, and I was wondering what kind of impact, uh, financial impact, or any others uh, that action would have with, uh, with the event. Um, because I, I, I read somewhere that there's more companies that were actually thinking of doing the same thing. Have you, do you have anything about that? Um, no, you sound like you're in a beautiful place, Stephen. Yeah, you can hear the cicada, right? Yes. Um, I don't have any uh, personal insight or knowledge, but uh, you've got to imagine how expensive that is because paying for and, and lining up the, I mean, Toyota is a, a major sponsor, Coca-Cola is a major sponsor. There are several um, anchor sponsors of the Olympics. These are for multi-year uh, or multi-Olympic uh, deals. It's not just a one shot. You usually buy um, a slot, a, a premier slot that extends over five uh, Olympic Games. So uh, them pulling out is a huge deal. I guess they ran through the calculations and the costing scenario about um, the negatives uh, compared to how much it cost them. Um, I don't have much more to add on that, but it, uh, it was a huge deal, obviously. Thank you. I just add, add Stephen to that comment. You know, I think that not only at Toyota, um, but you know, also the emperor, when he was thinking about what's the best way to engage in the Olympics and the Olympic ceremony, um, the idea is self-restraint. And I think that at Toyota and the emperor and other digni uh, dignitar dignita Japanese dignitaries felt that it was uh, inappropriate for them to 
uh, be part of the Olympic um, ceremony and Olympic celebrations and benefit from those celebrations when there was a, a, a burden being placed on the Japanese people and the Japanese community during the corona pandemic. And it, it, in my understanding, this is why the former Prime Minister, Prime Minister uh, Abe Shinzo, did not attend the opening ceremony despite being the champion of the Olympics, as well as many other dignitaries, is that they wanted to be in line with the ordinary Japanese people that were, you know, at home uh, watching the Olympic ceremonies, listening to cicadas like yourself. Um, and I think that's how you should, uh, in part, understand the general uh, restraint of businesses and uh, ordinary people and uh, elites in Japan to be overtly uh, out there celebrating and celebrating and participating in Olympic events. Yeah, yeah. That's, because that's what I thought that would be for a local company, you know, that has their uh, uh, roots, you know, in, 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 in the hosting country where it seems like the, the event is actually widely, uh, I mean, the, the population basically don't want it. So it would be like a, like a PR suicide of some sort, you know, so that's why I, I was like, well, it's uh, what kind of impact like financially it has with the overall event. But it's consistent with Japanese behavior that really prioritizes, at least on the surface, that everyone is being treated the same. And that, that's about, I think it's linked to Japanese society's um, social cohesion and relative um, stability is that, and, and, and I think that it, it, the protection of everybody's dignity by everybody, um, I guess, sharing the burden or everybody feeling the same pain. And, and I think it's, it's something critical for you to think about in the context of the Olympics but also in the context of 311, where you saw supermarkets in Sendai give each patron that lines up inside of the, outside the supermarket 10 products. And the idea was is that everybody came away with the exact same amount and, and that their dignities was protected. So I think that Toyota recognizes that. And, you know, we may think of it as a, you know, PR disaster that they lost money on this. But in the long run, I think the Japanese people will probably look at Toyota in, in the sense that, they didn't profit from the Olympics. They shared the same burden as, as ordinary Japanese. You have great observations. Ren, welcome to the floor. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's always a great room. Thank you for letting me speak. I just have a two quick uh, feedback or comments. Uh, there was a room uh, in which I was part of, um, it was overseas Japanese talking about the Olympics. And I guess uh, it was Ted who mentioned about the anti-Semitism uh, comment uh, by this uh, gentleman in Japan. And uh, many overseas Japanese people were so ashamed of this. And so I think uh, that feeling was shared outside of Japan as well among the overseas Japanese uh, people. And the second point, the second uh, comment is that, uh, just to echo in everyone, everyone's point about striking the right balance. And I think that the most symbolic one of that is the fireworks. Um, I hear some people talking about the fireworks was too short, was not extravagant, was too small. But uh, I think uh, people in Tokyo or people in Japan are trying to uh, celebrate the athletes but not forgetting that many people are still suffering uh, from the pandemic. And I, I personally thought that that fireworks were just the right amount, but I would like to hear how other people feel about it. You know, when I, when I think about the uh, Olympics and the, the opening ceremony, I, I can't um, forget the, the word that is used in sumo, that is almost undefinable, but kind of captures the, the sentiment, which is hinkaku, you know? There, there are some um, sumotori or, or um, uh, yokozuna who have been criticized for having it or for not having it. And hinkaku is a kind of essence of, of being um, respectful and um, demure uh, in light of uh, the circumstances. And that's the word that, that comes out to me, you know, the, the Japanese and the, the emperor himself. Um, a lot of the foreign visitors, not so much because they're they're not seeped in it. But um, I, I um, yes, I acknowledge that restraint that was was shown, and I think it's just a part of 
you know, one of the wonderful things about being here in Japan. Yes, the, the opening ceremony showed really consideration of so many things which uh, in the past probably wouldn't have been considered. And as you said, Ren, exactly. So um, it was, it's, it's um, struck the right balance. And I think that everybody who watched it, you know, um, people just have nothing, you know, to, to say in while well, criticizing it. Maybe with the exception, you know, of the length of the speech of Bach. But, well, that happens. <laughs> Yeah, so, well, thank you very much for this. Timothy, maybe we can continue right. with, yes, with the next topic then? Okay, great, thank you very much. So I'd like to get into geopolitics. Uh, there is a lot of uh, stuff going on. It has been going on. I guess these things take time to arrange and to organize this uh, coalition. Um, you know, the, the greatest thing that you can talk about in terms of geopolitics is what's going on with China. And what is the uh, response to that? How do people um, come together and uh, strategize? What is the best defense to this um, perceived encroachment on the seas and uh, China's uh, desire to overtake, you know, technology and um, uh, insert their uh, one China two political system um, agenda, which seems to be. Uh, all emphasis is on the one China policy. Um, so I'm going to go through a couple of points that uh, should indicate to you this growing, growing this um, um, development that um, projects or perhaps predicts um, what will be coming up in the near term. And if this, um, this, um, um, motion continues, um, it's, it's a very scary scenario that um, becomes uh, almost um, un, unavoidable. So uh, let me just run through those and then open the room um, to talk about it. Um, I'm sure there are other people that have a deeper insight, but there's a lot going on that, um, that we should uh, take into consideration. Part of it is, you know, the, the formation of different blocks um, country blocks, um, you know, the, them against us, and also the things that are going on here in the Asia Pacific. Indonesia is going to get a fleet of F-15s and F-18s. This is a big deal. They were prevented from actually purchasing such a fleet. It's a big deal. It's usually a multi-year project for parts and service and pilot training, that sort of thing. Indonesia getting that is a big deal. They've also been the recipient of, of uh, vaccines, which they haven't had um, um, access to, and as as you might know, Indonesia and uh, Malaysia in particular are suffering um, terribly from uh, the Delta virus. Eleven nations are participating right now in a massive U.S.-Australia multi military drills um, that are going on in Australia, but they're mostly sea drills and um, amphibious drills. And it's not, it's, it's touted as the U.S. Australia, but 11 other countries are participating in that. Um, that is going on now. It's not receiving a lot of news coverage, but it is in anticipation or preparation. People will say, um, if you ask them, this goes on all the time. This is not anything new. Um, please continue for marching forward. Um, but I think it is in the light of everything else. Um, for example, um, Japan has decided to do, to deploy their S-35 fighters to bolster Nansei Islands. Um, this is, you know, just another encroachment that is going forward. In the meantime, um, the Belt and Road that people know about, the Chinese philosophy or uh, policy of uh, building friends and influencing people by infrastructure and uh, investment, you know, one of the, the biggest problems they have is with Tibet. And uh, 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 Z visited Tibet uh, just this last weekend and um, was received with such fanfare because of the investment that's going on there. The, the uh, Chinese encroachment of Tibet has been a huge thorn in the side of the Western countries and their encroachment on an independent, on a autonomous uh, region. 
and, and just absorbing that is, seems to be taking on a new spirit and it seems to be uh, gaining a lot of proponents. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, Japan participating in, uh, in the uh, African waters with um, various countries on amphibious landings and aircraft. Right now, the Japan and the UK are actually in their first uh, carrier drills, um, joint carrier drills off of um, Africa. So that is continuing. This is a lot of stuff going on in a lot of different regions in anticipation. At the same time, China has warned Lithuania, who has suggested that they're going to open a Taiwan representative office, and they have received a strong rebuke from China that you shouldn't open up a representative office in Taiwan or else. And it's just Lithuania, it is just a representative office. Things like this seem to really uh, rankle um, uh, the, the Chinese and their, um, their resistance to anything um, that suggests um, Taiwan being its own independent entity. Um, something else has happened. You might remember that um, the United States has announced its withdrawal from Afghanistan. This has been a 20-year war going on there uh, by the United States. They have now decided to pull out. President uh, Biden has said that by nine, uh, by September 11th, uh, a date that we'll remember, by uh, September 11th, U.S. troops will be removed. This took everybody by surprise, a lot of people by surprise. Um, the troops are withdrawing, and apparently it's, it's somewhat um, not well organized. Um, the Taliban is um, flowing in to take over um, sites that are being abandoned and, and capturing, not capturing, but um, uh, taking over um, material that has been left aside. And this creates a huge um, opening for uh, China and Russia to um, help the people of Afghanistan reestablish themselves. The, as everybody knows, Afghanistan first had its its war with, with Russia, and Russia got a big bloody nose, and then the Americans moved in. So this is a kind of interesting uh, turn of events. At the same time, Afghanistan and Pakistan are um, contiguous countries, and the Taliban and the, um, uh, the freedom fighters in Pakistan are always um, at each other's uh, throats, and it turns out that the... Uh, Ambassador's daughter, um, the Afghan ambassador's daughter, the ambassador who was assigned to Pakistan, um, was kidnapped last week, and she was kidnapped and held um, for several hours. They got her back, um, but as a consequence of that, um, Afghanistan has withdrawn its diplomats from uh, Pakistan. This is huge. Um, in light of the fact that the United States is pulling out and the, uh, the Chinese and the Russians are uh, collaborating on how we might be able to help our Afghan um, friends. Um, it's just a, a rich mix on this them versus us uh, dichotomy that is slowly um, building that we need to be careful of. Um, the, the other thing that's so interesting, we, we brought up <clears throat> last week um, uh, the fact that um, uh, the president of the Philippines, Duterte, um, seemed to change his tune with regard to the Chinese, whereas initially he was very much against the Chinese. He was um, chasing their boats out of uh, Philippine water, and he was very aggressive. <clears throat> and now it turns out that um, they seem to be very friendly. Uh, he seems to be very friendly because of the uh, bridges and the industrial um, uh, projects that the Chinese are building with him. He is um, in an election campaign. Uh, he cannot survive himself as president, but um, as his candidate or his favorite candidate for president, he has pr promoted his daughter to become president. and. Um, suggested himself as the most viable candidate as vice president. So you see what's going on here. And if you can uh, in, imagine how valuable um, the Philippines are to uh, China's, um, I don't know, their dream or their idea or the suggestion that they want to have more of a prominent role in the South China Seas and the shipping lanes. Uh, this is a, 
a pretty big deal. And somebody like Duterte having that kind of legacy and being friendly with the Chinese is um, is worrisome. The most important um, uh, viable candidate against him is um, a fellow by the name of Manny Picardo. He is a um, uh, eight division champion welterweight. He's a boxer. He's very famous, very well known. He's a senator in uh, Philippine uh, politics. And until uh, a month ago, he was um, very much supportive of Duterte and now has uh, raised his claim to be potentially a candidate for president because the corruption and the, um, the, the coziness with China upsets him. Um, unfortunately, he was uh, deposed last week and is no longer a contender. So this, this geographical, this geopolitical um, the struggling that is going on uh, region-wide and also uh, within nations is something that you can see. It's splayed open for you as long as you've just fallen, and I hope with, that we can keep an eye on that. Um, and uh, finally, um, you know, Anthony Blinken, the foreign minister or the uh, secretary of state for the United States on Wednesday um, <clears throat> is uh, becoming more aggressive about uh, public pronouncements to ASEAN and, and uh, our neighbors uh, throughout the, this region here to be more aggressive, to be more cohesive in uh, their stance against uh, China and also um, their, he's, he's claimed their unlawful sea claims that we all need to get behind. And uh, just in light of that, uh, the president went and made a, um, uh, a public advisory on Hong Kong. So. United States country, uh, companies who are dealing with Hong Kong, you are put on notice now. It is unstable. It is, um, it is a, a not a good place for you to invest. It is, you should be considering your options there. So this is coming full circle. A lot of things are, are moving into play. We will follow this, and as we follow it as time goes by, um, it is, well, it is not... Well, we don't hope for it, but it does look like it's it's going to get worse before it gets better. That the uh, the, the lines of demarcation will be much more stark as we move forward. Um, so I just tee that up. I'm sure there are other people that have something to say. By the way, Stephen, you had a great article in the Japan Times. I think it was yesterday that appeared. Um, great insight into um, you know what's going on with China and the United States. Thanks, Timothy. Lots, to, lots of uh, interesting points. Um, I, I just want to focus on, the, I guess, the Japan side of, of the points that you mentioned, because um, this is a J Japan politics side. But um, right. I think one of the core issues that we should be really following, um, not only this week and last week, but going forward, is China's or Japan's stance vis-à-vis -vis Taiwan. And we've really seen Japan really push the envelope in terms of the One China policy. Uh, at the U.S.-Japan uh, uh, meeting between Prime Minister Suga and President Biden, there was a, a comment about peace and stability in the Taiwanese Straits. The joint communique by the G7 also had a statement on Taiwan and including Taiwan in the w, w, uh, WHO and other international organizations. Um, so we've seen at the international level, Japan really you know, pushed the envelope, which is I think is, is fascinating, but it's dangerous. And even at the domestic level, we've seen uh, the defense minister, uh, Nobu Kishi, we've seen uh, the deputy prime minister, uh, Taro Aso, also make comments about Japan coming to Taiwan's aid if there is some kind of conflict. These are really big movements and it's something to watch because Taiwan really is the red line for Beijing. Um, you mentioned the, tail, the tailsman exercises uh, off the west, uh, east coast of Australia. That's a really important. Japan's a big part of it. It shows both the unity of the uh, Japan-US-Australia relationship, but also the divisions. Um, Indonesia and India, in, in particular India, is not participating directly. They're acting as an observer in these exercises, which really raises questions about the integrity of the Quad Indeed. security dialogue, the Quad, and is India a reliable partner? Because I think Japan, the United States, and Australia are thinking about um, broader security within the region uh, with India in, in mind. And if India is not a reliable partner, 
uh, then uh, that trio is going to have to think about uh, rearranging the uh, geopolitical landscape within the region with other partners. Um, so I think that is really important. You mentioned Japan um, and the UK and their joint exercises. This is really important. Japan's also advocating for the UK's inclusion into the Comprehensive Progressive and Trans-Pacific Partnership. And I, I have no doubt that the UK will be part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership moving forward. Um, and this shows Japan leading multilateralism and expanding multilateral uh, relationships um, with key partners like the UK. And the UK has also said this week that they're going to have a permanent presence um, in the Indo-Pacific. So uh, Japan seems to be kind of the, the, the link that's bringing in countries in the multilateral forum, in the security forum, and pushing the envelope of how we balance our one China policy between recognizing uh, Beijing as the sole and legitimate government of China, um, but uh, pushing the envelope in terms of how they're recognizing and interacting with Taiwan. So there's a lot of movement on the table. Um, but Japan at the center, and I think it's uh, something to watch. You know, Stephen, we can't we can't talk about um, this issue much without mentioning the um, uh, incredible uh, video that was distributed last week about uh, the Chinese uh, boisterously uh, threatening Japan with nuclear weapons and um, dividing. Uh, the country into four uh, separate countries to prevent um, any other uh, in incursion of the, the Japanese in, in Southeast Asia. Again, that was just, if, if people haven't seen or heard this, it was uh, really uh, a remarkable video. Yeah, it sure was. And, and uh, Timothy, when you uh, watch the video, first of all, I think it's important, it didn't come from the central gov government's Specifically, it came from a uh, Communist Party cell in northeastern China, uh, which was, you know, received the brunt of, of the Japanese imperial imperialism. So there's a, a, a broader, I guess, anti-Japanese sentiment there. Um, but the fact that it was retweeted um, on Japanese or, or on, on Chinese Weibo by um, a central government uh, CCP cell suggests that it was a, a message that was acknowledged and allowed for um, by the central government, which is uh, actually quite scary. Suggested um, marketing, now, yeah. For anybody, yeah, um, so for any of you that don't know, the message basically was is that this party cell was advocating for the Japanese exception to China's no first strike um, uh, rule in which China basically said that it will never be the first country the first country to use nuclear weapons in a nuclear conflict and except, except if Japan uh, uh, engages in any uh, proactive um, position to defend Taiwan from uh, China and um, this is a real shock um, you know it touches upon many I think taboos uh, the fact that you're overtly talking about nuclear attacks um, for the Japanese, of course, they're very sensitive to the concepts of nuclear war and, of course, being a victim again of, of a nuclear attack. So it was uh, insensitive, it was shocking, but it also demonstrates um, how the uh, central um, uh, government, uh, uh, controlled by Xi Jinping, um, is uh, tactically acknowledging this issue and how they prioritize it in their broader regional policies. Yes, Stefan. Uh... The, I think that video, I, I did see that, I did watch that, and there were many things in there, like you said, but uh, the biggest one, the most uh, offensive one, was the fact that they mentioned that since Japan was the only country that was attacked by a nuclear weapon, and so it is efficient to use that to Japan, and that is... Uh, so inhuman uh, beyond any uh, level, I think, in terms of humanity of, of, of the human race. Uh, it doesn't have to be Japan, it can be any country uh, that, uh, how should I say, uh, to, to say things like that, uh, like you have been a nuclear uh, victim once, how about an another time? Uh, let's try you again. Yeah, that's, that's a little bit beyond any, any human imagination, uh, among all the things that were in the video. 
um, that's my that's my uh, my two cents there. Yeah, I would, I would agree absolutely, Ren. And um, you know, it's uh, it's it's not the best example of how to win friends and, and influence people. And if China would really like to um, de-escalate and uh, allay the concerns of neighboring countries around uh, its periphery, which has been a long-term foreign policy uh, priority, these kinds of statements are not the way to do it. And and I think that. Um, this will not play well in the Japanese public. It will only reinforce, uh, I think, the conservative elements as well as, um, you know, uh, uh, left center uh, security specialists in Japan to um, build up their bilateral relationships with the United States, but also invest in multilateral partnerships and more strategic partnerships like the one that I think is emerging between Australia and Japan. And I think moving forward is uh, thinking about what we call mini laterals, this, this kind of coordination between three or four or five states uh, that have shared security concerns in the region, um, mostly vis-a-vis -vis China, but also North Korea and um, other emerging challenges. Well, thank you for that, the analysis. And, um... Timothy, if, uh, well, we have um, finished with the comments on this, then we can continue with uh, the next topic, the vaccines. Okay, okay. the comments are, are unending. There's plenty more to talk about yes. with regard to this particular issue, but let's, let's push it off until next week. Next week, it will be a completely new week. We'll have lots of other things to talk about. Plus, um, Stephen and Maya are going to have an independent uh, room just talking about geopolitical political issues, these kinds of things that are so rich and detailed, um, deserve a room, and I'm looking forward to it. I just wish it wasn't, I didn't have to wait until September, but um, thank you very much for taking the initiative on that. <clears throat> Let's move on. So, vaccines and vaccine diplomacy. You know, um, when the, the Portuguese decided to sail uh, west and discover the new worlds and discover the gold from the Incas and the Mexicans, and it just created an empire that um, that lasted for uh, 300 years, and then the, the Spanish came in, and they built their armada, and the, uh, the, the flow of trade that they dominated um, eventually to be taken over by England in the, the 1600s. Um, we are witnessing something like that going on right now. Um, and probably with a couple of years of perspective, maybe 10 or 15, in fact, uh, we'll actually begin to appreciate it. But what's going on with vaccines right now and vaccine diplomacy is exactly that, that same kind of thing. The, the dominant players will, and the rich, um, the, 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 the companies that will be uh, generating the windfall are these high-tech um, uh, um, manufacturers of uh, vaccines. It is just unmistakable. Even though they're making some and uh, donating and giving them away, somebody is paying for that. And there are only three or four companies that are doing it um, uh, for the Western world. There are, uh, the Russians and the Chinese have their own versions. Um, there's uh, uh, an open controversy about the uh, efficacy of, of each of them, but it seems like, you know, uh, Moderna and Pfizer um, AstraZeneca are, are the leaders and they're the most wanted of, of the vaccines. Um, the, the countries that are able to uh, receive those, first of all, are the producing countries. So that's going to be England, uh, Germany, and the United States. Um, everybody else is on the receiving end. And the amount of money, government money, that is being uh, funneled to, to pay for this. Uh, other countries um, who wish to develop that just cannot come up the learning curve quickly enough. And the uh, producers are unwilling to sell the IP so that they can. I mean, the amount of layered technology that goes into uh, building these um, uh, this kind of um, antivirus um, vaccine. It's a new vaccine. It's, it, it, it is, uh, you know, RNA messenger vaccine. It's, it's a new style of, of medicine. Um, even countries, for example, South Africa, that wants to participate in that, it takes years and years, even if they have the factories to, to produce it, to have the, the technology and the, um, 
the security and the uh, the clean rooms to do that. Um, you know, in the meantime, people are uh, getting the, the the virus and and dying and suffering as a result of that, and their economies are just going to hell. And this is happening throughout the globe. And when you look at the numbers of countries in countries who are receiving the vaccines and are getting inoculated and those who are not, the difference is just stark. So the African nations in particular, um, some of the Southeast um, Asian island countries are, um, are suffering from that as well, um, South America. But um, you're seeing a, a divergence now of those who have vaccines or access to vaccines and those who don't. Um, the um, current status of vaccines and inoculation here in Japan seems to have hit a saturation point. Uh, similarly, we see this in the United States. Some of it is related to the, um, the dichotomy between Republicans and Democrats in the United States. Um, but here in Japan, I think it's just vaxxers, anti-vaxxers. It seems like those are people who want to get vaccinated will get vaccinated, have already gotten vaccinated. The Prime Minister has proudly reported that about 80% of the 60 years and older have received two shots. Um, I'm sorry, have received one shot, and about 54% have received two shots. And it is, is his goal that by um, uh, August, um, you know, the vast majority of those who are in the most um, susceptible um, range, which used to be the older people. It is not now anymore. It's now uh, with the Delta variant, it's the people in their 20s and 30s um, who are uh, susceptible. So it's a, it's a moving target. Um, but with the alcohol restrictions and uh, the desire of carrot and stick, you know, please get vaccinated. If you get vaccinated, these good things will happen. We'll have an Olympics. You'll be able to go to the stadium. And the stick of, you know, getting penalized, you know, if you're out drinking, if you're out after eight o'clock in a restaurant, you're going to get into trouble. The, the fines, the huge controversy that they had, you know, let's find these people if they keep selling alcohol after eight o'clock and then a day later they have to withdraw that because the, the, the lobby of alcohol um, distributors in Japan is so powerful and provide a lot of money for, um, you know, elections. They had to pull back on that. Um, so what the, the, um, the policymakers now are considering is rather than the carrot and stick is let's, let's use what Japan is really supposed to be good at, that science technology, monitors, um, you know, uh, uh, sensors to uh, detect, you know, even in, in Narita now, for, for people who, who use international travel, you see these things. It, it started a couple of years ago where they had biometric identification with your um, fingerprint and then the, the reading the, the retina. And you remember that that started, it was announced, and then it started, and then all of a sudden it was all over. It was in Narita, it was in Hanida. Um, and the movement from the airplane to the luggage carousel became so much easier because it was just um, uh, a, a more advanced way of dealing with it. You gave up, well, some people would say, some of your um, your personal privacy in order to achieve that, but um, it did happen awful quickly. And I think we're on the cusp of seeing that here in Japan too. It seems that the exhaustion of uh, lockdowns doesn't work anymore. Uh, don't drink alcohol, don't shout, don't, uh, don't gather in groups. It's not beginning to work and the Japanese need to shift. And in fact, that's where uh, there's potentially more money to be made in any event on sensors and, and monitors, um, carbon dioxide monitors, so that um, eateries and, and places where people gather, it can be um, calibrated so that more air is circulated, so that the, the possibility of, of COVID, or not COVID, but any variants that come in, into the future are um, you know prepared for. And also the, the discovered that the wastewater system is a um, primary carrier of uh, these uh, pathogens, and so um, the uh, potentially the the rebuilding of the the water systems and the um, uh, the wastewater systems throughout the city and probably um, eventually nationwide. That's a big uh, infrastructure project, but that is being under consideration too. 
So a lot is going on with vaccines and vaccine diplomacy. We are seeing a shift now. Um, once the Olympics gets over, um, you will see the shift in, in discussion and how the, the Japanese government policy-wide decides to handle this. And I think it's, it's well acknowledged that uh, COVID is just a, the wake-up bell. It's hit us really hard, but probably these kinds of things we can anticipate uh, on a recurring basis, even if it's only once every 10 or 15 years or so, it is going to be significant enough for us to um, prepare for it. And maybe this is the way to do that. So uh, with that, um, I'd like to draw this one up. We would open the room. I know there are a lot of people that want to come up and um, uh, offer some insight and some uh, uh, some commentary. So um, let the um, let the games begin, Maya. Yes, thank you for that. Uh, we've got Yuka, so I think that uh, she's got uh, well something to add about the vaccines and uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, actually, you know, because I think we're talking about now that we may need a third booster shot because of this Delta virus. But on anyway, um, before that, uh, thank you so much for detailing the uh, opening ceremony because it was 4 a.m. I just, just couldn't see. It. And then only thing I've heard was they play the uh, theme music from major video games. And that's the only thing I saw I heard. So. Uh, Anyway, thank you. But in, anyway, I have a sort of game attend tendency, so... Okay, I mean, joking on the side. I have two uh, more uh, serious side questions. Number one, um, I just saw this on LinkedIn. Um, seems like not all athletes are tested for COVID because they, they run out of testing kits. And they're, they're saying they, what, you know, the, they didn't know how to count. So is this really, is it really true? Um, and then number two is going back to uh, the Pfizer and then vaccine diplomacy. I thought that maybe two, three months ago, India asked um, maybe Pfizer and Madonna to share the, uh, you know, the IP. The IP. Well, yeah, IP, I mean, right. I thought, I thought that, and then, then you know, the, the but the President Biden agreed to that request. I mean, I just failed to follow up after that. I haven't heard anything. So maybe it didn't work out. So if you uh, have an update, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I don't have an update on that, but it was a big issue when um, Biden suggested it. I think it probably went nowhere. Um, the companies are not obliged to do that, even if they would get uh, certain benefits as a consequence of that, I think there's too much money to be made, and they want to keep keep their uh, their hands on that. Um, there are manufacturing uh, facilities here in in Japan that are capable of producing it, but even the Japanese were unable to um, get that kind of of um, um, recognition. Um, I think, yeah. Um, the, the fact that the president didn't come to, to Tokyo, maybe there would have been an opportunity to talk about that with the prime minister, um, but that just didn't happen, and instead uh, his wife came. Um, I think she'll only be here um, until tomorrow. Um, the, the first issue you asked, what was the first issue? Oh, was like, about, you know, they, they run out of this and get a piece oh, of you or what, yeah. I, I cannot, I can't uh, verify that. It strikes me as um, um, unlikely because they have a playbook. Uh, the playbook that they've been talking about, all of the athletes have access to the playbook, the coaches, the organizers, and they're supposed to be getting tested every other day. Um, and so in order to do that, the PCR tests are um, not as expensive uh, on a mass market. Um, Maybe the analyst uh, analysis of them takes a little bit of time, but I, I think that's all in play and, and um, well set up. I think the Japanese can be relied on for that. But I, I have heard that. that okay. That okay, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that because I was hoping that was like you said. You know, it wasn't true. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you. There's a, there's a lot going on with um, 
uh, treatment of fake news and uh, you know turning people off because they're creating rumors and stuff like that. The problem is that a, a lot of things that come out as fake news or as rumors or as um, uh, conspiracy theory are in fact real news, especially in light of, of the government that's trying to keep tabs on what is being said and how the population is going to react to that. And we can't have a panic and we can't let the people know because otherwise there'd be other serious repercussions. So there's that, that uh, tension that's going on. It's, it's a huge fight. It's a battle in the United States, but uh, there are, are um, there's evidence of it here in Japan as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Yuka. Well, it seems that uh, different uh, media outlets uh, have different news. And as Timothy mentioned in the beginning, there is a lot of tension. I think that a lot of governments are actually learning, you know, how to manage the risk, the crisis in terms of um, disclosing information, what kind of news to disclose and so on. So uh, hopefully they're getting better, but uh, that's also a two-sided coin, I believe. So let's hope that it will, will be for you know for the benefit of um, the general population and not for the benefit of uh, the governments or even the corporations you know that are involved in this pandemic and well let's see um i would like to invite everybody who you know has a question or a comment just let us know we will let you up here and we can talk a little bit more steven i i saw you flash your mic Yes, I, I have a, a, a question. Uh, I'm not sure if it's related to anything that, um, that uh, Tim was talking about, but I wanted to know if he has any insight regarding that gentleman, um, that French citizen who is doing the hunger strike with regards to... Excellent. Yeah, and, and so I wonder how, um, if the, the Japanese government or, I mean, how everything is going, is there any change that, that uh, people are considering? Okay, so thank you very much for that. Uh, we talked about it a little bit at the beginning. Were you were you um, on when we talked about it? Probably not. No. Okay, you get through demerits. Please keep a record of that, Mike. Sure. Um, <laughs> um, so yes, uh, Macron is is in Japan. He visited with um, the prime minister and actually had lunch with him. Uh, so that is the only dignitary that I am aware of that he actually had lunch with that was promoted as a lunch with Macron. Um, and Macron promised to Vincent. Um, Vincent um, took his issue to The Hague. He received some action on that. And uh, the, the French uh, premier promised that he would take this to heart and do something about it because this Frenchman is suffering from um, the, the law that is uh, applied in Japan for uh, sole custody, not joint custody, as is recognized in France, and he'll do something about it. So in his hunger strike, he actually had it um, um, prepared so that by the time Macron gets to Japan, he will have been in his hunger strike for 10 or 15 days, and that's exactly what's happened. So I think today is day 15. If Macron was going to visit him, it would have been... Um, yesterday because he, he visited with the Prime Minister on uh, Friday they had lunch and so Saturday would have been the day uh, Sunday I guess he's probably going to be preparing to leave or leave on Monday I think it's it's likely that he's going to visit with uh, Vincent who is camped out at uh, Sendagaya station I visit um, with Vince frequently. Um, one of the um, fears that we had was that on the day that um, all of the action starts, not the opening ceremony, which is on Friday, but on Thursday, that's when a lot of things start. That's when they, the, um, they have their, their big event at the uh, state guest house and a lot of the dignitaries are flying in. We were afraid that uh, the police would move in and physically remove Vincent from Sendagaya. What we received instead was um, a uh, promise from the foreign ministry that the police were going to leave him alone. They weren't going to uh, harass him or escort him out or um, create some sort of scene where he had to be removed. So that, that provided everybody with a, a lot of relief. Um, he is being visited by all sorts of people, by mothers who have had their children kidnapped as well. 
But, and you know, I, I was wondering if, um, because this issue affects as well um, uh, Japanese citizens, right? Japanese uh, families, mom and dad. Uh, so is there a conversation that started within the Justice Department or, or um, any, any offices uh, in Japan? Yes. That, oh, okay. Yes. So um, it is instructive to note that um, six members of the parliament have visited Vincent, uh, showing their support. These are people from the upper house, from the lower house, from the LDP, from other uh, opposite, opposition parties as well. So this is an issue that is acknowledged by the Japanese. Uh, the victimization of the parent that is left out is so totally um, out of balance of what happens to the parent who has the children and the amount of, of um, a negotiating power or uh, pain that they can inflict just by uh, keeping the other parent completely isolated from, from their children. Um, so it does seem like it's building. Um, I'm a great supporter of, of Vincent and these issues because unless something happens, unless there is a, a vanguard, it's not, nothing's going to happen. It's, I mean, it, this is Japan. Things don't change by themselves. They require actors. They require change agents. They require um, a, a, a level of controversy. And he's put it, you know, it, it's not stating it too far to say he's, he's put his life on the line. He's going to um, not eat any food. If today is day 16, he hasn't eaten um, just drinking water. Um, until he is able to see his children again. And it's been more than three years. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. I think that everybody who, who is, well, who has children here in Japan or anywhere in the world, we can all um, actually, uh, all words don't come, come up, sorry, but yes, uh, we can sympathize and uh, with, with Vincent and hope that things get resolved really not only for him but uh, for the you know the parents who are going to, to encounter the same challenges in the future yes and we are almost close to 10 o'clock uh, so uh, Ren, please yes join yeah, us I, I just uh, a quick question uh, if timothy knows something about this i was reading a news week um and you know this cuba i know this sounds far away from asia pacific region but the cubans uh protesters are silenced because of the chinese backing the government of cuba just to block the internet access how how much truth is it in newsweek's uh, report in other words is newsweek's <laughs> Uh, spreading the rumors, or is Newsweek still a reliable source of, of media? Do you know anything about this uh, China's involvement helping the Cuban government to, to block the internet access for these uh, Cuban protesters? Um, I'm, I'm not up to speed on that. I do know that the internet access was with, withdrawn and it uh, prevented them from cohesively dealing with the, you know, as protesters dealing against the, the government. Uh, the United States could have, but did not um, insert uh, technologies that would have allowed um, internet access. Um, but certainly the Chinese, and particularly you would think that the Russians are eager to keep this, this um, uh, dynamic going between Cuba and the United States. So I think that story is, um, is not over yet. But uh, I, I can't comment one way or the other on the credibility of news which Okay, thank you. But Newsweek, I don't, I don't see Newsweek, Newsweek very often these days. Are they still a major source of uh, a reliable uh, media in general? That's a different kind of question. But, uh... It is a different kind of question, and I think all of us are challenged by um, news that we're receiving and uh, the sources and the reliability and the competence. Of, of news stories, the war that's going on in the United States among uh, media outlets and the conservatives and the Democrats is just, it is um, so um, outstanding what is going on there. And the United States is supposed to be the bastion of, of free speech and, um, uh, you know, free, free competition among, um, uh, you know, publishers and newspapers and communications. 
but it seems like that has all been usurped. So I think people are right to question, um, you know, where they get their news. And the other story that's coming out is that um, people might rely on their, building their own sources, you know, using the internet as um, developing their own sources and making up their mind without having somebody write uh, an article to try and uh, manipulate them into reaching uh, a foregone conclusion. But now what we're realizing with uh, big tech is that they're also managing and monitoring that. So it's you scratch your head and you, you just wonder, you know, who, who can I rely on as a, um, a reliable source of information? But at least you guys have, you know, this from <laughs> Japanese politics 101. Yeah. <laughs> but for sure, for sure, if that Newsweek's uh, report turns out to be true, I think uh, China, U.S., and probably involving Japan will Will be uh, the relationship will be elevated to a different level because we are talking about a country that is the backyard of, of the U.S. Right? Uh, oh sure. Yeah. yeah. And also the um, you know Mr. Aso said something about you know Japan should go to the aid of Taiwan in the event of an incursion. And days later, you had this horrible uh, video that uh, Stephen and I were talking about, uh, which was released. You know the, the thing that's going on with um, with Cuba. It just it it's days later that all of a sudden the um, the cyber attacks that are emanating from China have reached a peak. So there's there's this you know it's it's warfare that um, we're not accustomed to. It's a it's a new style, and they say that you know warfare will be a cyber warfare before it becomes a kinetic warfare. And I think that yeah, there are different ways and a lot of other ways to fight um, this war, including through the stock market and what's going on with um, China's um, uh, cybersecurity agency and how the Chinese are able to uh, develop technology and the supply chain and the chips and condensers that they manufacture. Um, it is a whole new world and um, it's important for us to, to talk about that and I, I so much appreciate it everybody's interested in in, um, in having this conversation and exploring these issues because at some point in our lifetime it is going to become an issue of, of uh, prominent importance to us I predict so um, thanks for your input we're in I always appreciate your insight thank you oh, yes I can't talk a minute yes a minute oh, okay. <laughs> oh, all right so you know the, um, the more you know, chaos I hear on this uh, kind of a geopolitics, it sounds to me more and more that the Abe has a little bit pressure to rerun again for the third term. You know, when he runs for the second term, you know, the only reason he kind of run was that uh, he, he, you know, they kind of, he needs to take take back to the LDP in the leadership to totally take manage Japan but from China, right? So then, uh, this is Chinese has been very quiet, you know, during uh, the Trump era. But when the uh, election chaos started in the United States in uh, November, and the uh, Chinese got so something so active, uh, now I showed to you before that the Chinese are trying to do the, 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 the blockade of a Persian Gulf. Right? So, we, you know, we kind of narrowly avoided that about a month ago. Yeah, so just like a kind of chaos after chaos, you know, because the Chinese party tried to attack, you know, the U.S. and now, and I guess because uh, Chinese probably thought the U.S. was at the very weak or vulnerable point, where that they can really, you know, so the United States may, may not be able to mobilize the military in, uh, in the middle of the, uh, the coronavirus and because of the chaotic eruption. But, but that has not been exactly the case, you know. So it can be like a nightmare after nightmare, you know, uh, from the, like say, the U.S. point of view, right? And, uh, and uh, Japan like has uh, no other option just to just to focus the United States in reality because uh, <laughs> the the military military owns the communication system of, of the uh, Japan and also Japanese military force you know so the the prime minister defense minister they cannot give a marching order to the defense force for the U.S. military camp so so for that it's uh, yeah. yeah so like it's just so much chaos here it's like uh, it's amazing so then now. Uh, there are more and more I can hear the thing, you know, and I think this is, I can see that it's a coming, are they coming back then, uh, yeah. to, you know, revise the constitution 
and uh, start building the military power. And uh, isn't this a French president showing up in Tokyo? And I, I'm pretty sure that his uh, only agenda that he really has is not this, uh, you know, this, uh, the poor so, so people, unfortunately. Yeah, no, uh, no, his agenda is uh, it's, it's always like this, you know. So there's like some tension in the Pacific, right, in the Asia. Yeah. So, you know, the French is uh, joined the, uh, you know, UK Navy, you know, British Navy, to send their best, like, naval force to the Asia right now, right? So that they're just uh, getting close to, you know, to organize themselves so to get ready for the war with the Japanese to happen. So the part of the war is, uh, you know, the French was supposed to tell, you know, the French arm to us, right? The Japanese, uh, Korea, or whoever, right? Yeah, so, so for that, like, I know even the French is showing up here, it's just to just, uh, you know, the business. <laughs> it's okay, it's like that. <laughs> Yeah. So whenever there's a French, you know, that this president is a, uh, it, it's like a, he, he's like a chief, like a pitching officer for the French business. You know? So yeah. whenever he goes to travel and have a meeting, it's always about this business pitch. You know? <laughs> well, it's it's not just him. It is not just him. But also, did the Japanese produce the uh, new defense policy? Um, it, they just produced it um, two weeks ago. Right. Right. And, right. And absolutely, I agree with you, um, uh, Abe coming back, you know, Abe is looking for, and maybe this is, it's not a false flag, but it's um, some sort of a crisis that emerges either in North Korea or in South Korea or someplace where the Japanese are just shook from their foundations. The Japanese do have an option, Hayato. They have the peace constitution or they have um, rearmament and going beyond, you know, um, uh, GDP, a percentage of GDP being dedicated to uh, defense and the reliance on the United States. The, that, that option that they have of being remarkable in having their peace constitution and only um, self-defense um, capabilities, that's being challenged now. And this, this video that came out of, of, of China is just like in your face because it says, you, you might want to be a, a peaceful country, but um, we have nuclear weapons. And um, if you uh, come to the aid of the United States, if we make an incursion in Taiwan, then you will suffer the most. You will suffer the most horrible thing that you can ever imagine, you know, nuclear destruction. Um, so I think the, the choices are being made for them. Uh, and you can see signs of it in the, the defense policy. And the fact that um, the Japanese have not been known for building um, high-tech submarines, but it looks like um, that is one of the things that um, uh, they will be um, uh, spending more time on. I think that being an island nation, it makes sense. They just have, in the past, purchased um, high-quality submarines elsewhere. But I think that industry and also the, um, the aircraft industry, the jet fighter industry, uh, you know, you'll you'll start seeing that, and all of a sudden, you turn around in five years or ten years, that peace constitution is is a, a thing of the past. Right, right, and also, so it's so interesting that also, and the part of the you mentioned about this, that Indonesia getting access to F fifteen or you know or sixteen, you know, yeah. So because um, um, yeah, so because that was that Indonesia's concept to be based on a strategic like that country, and uh, you know, and uh, they're, they're having this access to this uh, military, so, you know, the, the F 15, 16, and the maybe Venture 35 is maybe kind of interesting in a way, obviously. Move now, my another question in the back of my mind is uh, how, how much of those F 15 or 16 gaps are black? That's another question. Because, <laughs> uh, you, know, you know, that's kind of, you probably know this, Timothy, right? So, this, uh, you know, FFD 16 for five, you have to maintain on daily basis, right? So, in order to maintain them, you need, uh, you know, talk, you know, to main, for maintenance. And, uh, many of the planes that were supplying the parts to the, uh, like India or Pakistan, they, they didn't get the supply part. So, they are, you know, uh, they're sitting waiting for the maintenance, you know, maybe 70% of them, right? And also, oh, yeah. Uh, Right, right. Yeah, um, because the, the United States will sell them. You can have, um, um, we're, we're having a discount this this month on the F-15s and the F-18s, and you pay this amount, but this is what you get, and you get the full package. That's item C, 
or something in between. And I think that's um, that's the way that one rolls out. So if they have um, you know the, the discounted option, they have um, you know the parts and supplies. Maybe not the pilots, maybe not the training, but it's something that's already there that can be ramped up fairly quickly. But the full packages, yes, it's very expensive. I mean, very few countries can actually afford it, even if they qualify. So I think it's just a big deal whether they have the, uh, the full deal um, with the training and the parts and the supply and the long term, because it's it's generally a you know ten or fifteen year plan to have those aircraft um, serviced and. You know, once they, they purchase them, they're going to be good for, you know, a, a good generation or so before they're uh, eclipsed by something that's faster or, or more high-tech. Right, right, right. But, yeah, but still, like, it's a very significant move to supply those, uh, you know, F-15, 16 to the Oh, Indonesia. absolutely. Yeah, huge. <laughs> huge. I, and, and you can see if you're China, you see this, um, this um, you know, if, if you hate the United States, you're going to characterize it as an encroachment by the United States on our domain. You know, this is our ocean, this is our sea, and if it wasn't for the Japanese, you know, we would have um, uh, more full control, and, and probably we wouldn't have to rely on the uh, the United States dollar to purchase and, and to conduct trade, and um, we wouldn't have to deal with all of this. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, so maybe Thank Japan is coming back to that big military, you know, production uh, manufacturing country again. Yeah, I think I think um, you're right. I, I think that march will take five to um, to eight years. I don't think it'll happen so quickly, but it, you know, we'll we'll notice that happening. Um, it will happen under the the guidance of the United States, and then eventually the the, the Japanese will just. Um, be independent and go their own way and, and have their own their own army and military and offensive and, and defensive forces as well. Right, right. Yeah, the U.S. would like that very much for them. Each country to defend themselves also, right? Instead of just the U.S. doing the whole thing. The, the U.S. might like it, but, you know, we, we talked about, you know, the, the fact that um, the, the president of South Korea wouldn't visit Japan this week, you know, and, right, and the fact right. that India is just going as an observer to the um, talisman saber um, exercises in Australia, you know the best the best compatriot in that issue, especially in light of the Indians being somewhat lukewarm, is South Korea. So I think you know job number one for the United States is for the United States is for Japan and, and South Korea to to put these issues aside, resolve these issues, and um, you know form a cohesive group, you know, they, they're next door neighbors, what in the hell is, um, you know, stopping these two countries who are so similar in many ways to be um, better friends and, and you know, they're, I mean, they, uh, oppressing forces are right at your throat and they're not, um, they're not for the faint of heart, these are, these are serious issues, so you would hope that um, Japan and, and South Korea would have uh, overcome these obstacles, but um, it's been 70 years and they quite haven't yet. Right, and I guess the president of South Korea is uh, gone <laughs> in the mind, including the U.S., so it's, <laughs> it's a matter of time. Yeah, no matter yeah. what he say or he try, it's, it's going to be gone this year. Yes, indeed. Yes, yeah, Timothy, yeah. yes. <laughs> Okay, so, um, well, we are well past beyond uh, the time which uh, we originally thought uh, we wanted to finish this call. So thank you very much, everybody, for the comments, uh, for the analysis. Thank you very much for joining the discussion, for listening to it. Timothy, thank you very much for, uh, well, thank you, Maya. preparing for the room in such a wonderful way. And uh, Ted, Ren, Yuka, Hayato, thank you, really. So... Um, Yes, uh, as uh, you may have noticed, this uh, call has been recorded uh, as uh, the previous calls. It will be uploaded on Japan Expert Insights and also on YouTube later. Um, also, if you would like to learn more about politics uh, and public affairs, you can visit uh, Timothy Langley, his company's um, YouTube channel. Um, that's Langley Squire, uh, Tokyo on Fire as well. Or you can also subscribe for his um, 
um, newsletter. Newsletter, yeah. Yes, uh, so very informative as well. Um, also, please um, uh, be informed that, uh, as uh, Timothy mentioned earlier, Dr. Na uh, Nagi and I are go uh, working on a project uh, about the Indo-Pacific and Japan's uh, role in it. So uh, there will be another regular room starting in, in September, so prepare for it and keep tuned. And uh, well, we are going to close the room now. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we wish you a wonderful day and also take care and hydrate. So see you next week. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ren. Thank you, Hayato. Ted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yuka. Thanks, everybody else. So many great people. Timothy in the room. Jennifer. Kelly. Thank yeah. you. Thank Ashitaka. you. Yes. So see you next week. Next see you time. next week. Yes. Thank you, Maya. Thanks for monitoring Thank you. this.